it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, and I'm excited to share with you the latest that um, Terrapin's been working on with respect to biophilic design. So um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it, many of the years that I've been working with Terrapin have been spent um, in the world of biophilic design, um, which started around 2010. Um, and has grown um, increasingly uh, over the last 10 years. And um, I think with, the, um, with COVID, it has become an even more, um, the awareness um, and understanding around designing with, um, with nature has become all the more important and respected. So um, I'm happy to share with you some of the, the history and some case studies and then uh, look forward to any questions you may have at the end. So um, to start with, uh, we, a lot of the, 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 the basis of some of the research historically has been to, to question why some places are beautiful. Why do we intuitively respond to some places? Why do we like some places more than others? And, the, the German psychoanalyst Eric Fromm first coined the term biophilia in 1964. And he defined it as the connections that human beings subconsciously seek with the rest of life. Um, Harvard biologist Edward Wilson popularized the, the biophilia hypothesis later in later publications in the 1980s and 90s. Um, when he defined biophilia as the innately emotional affiliation of human beings with other living organisms. Um, biophilic design translates this theory, like bio biophilic design as a practice, translates this theory into practice through nature-inspired design for specifically for mental and physical cognitive health and well-being. So uh, for a little, little more history, um, this seminal study by Roger Ulrich in 1984 looked at the significance of health recovery indicators between patients with a view, um, a window view to a moderately vegetated landscape. You can see the, in the little black and white um, floor plan on the lower left of the screen. Um, that is basically the floor plan he was working with in the study. So there's just a top of trees at one view um, compared to patients with a view to a brick wall. So you see the indicators where people would be seeing a brick wall as opposed to seeing the grass or the trees. So um, this research, the learning how quickly people responded to or recovered um, and had fewer, fewer um, medications or required fewer medications during their recovery process kind of shed a light on, on what it meant to, to have a quality view. So over the decades, um, continued research um, on a number of themes have, have surfaced to give perspective on what biophilic, mean, biophilic design means in practice. Um, and uh, there's a few themes that this research has evolved um, or you know, surfaced. So I'd like to cover a few of them before jumping into um, biophilic design specifically. So British geographer Jay Appleton first proposed the notion of prospect refuge, suggesting that certain environmental conditions meet basic psychological needs by offering the capacity to observe without being exposed. And that can be exposed to environmental elements or exposed to too many people. Um, so uh, he called this prospect refuge theory. While prospect and refuge are two unique conditions in and of themselves, the positive experience strength, um, st is strengthened when the two are combined, hence prospect refuge theory. Um, prospect and refuge are also two of the most commonly utilized biophilic design patterns. However, um, the design challenge is often in find, finding the right balance between the two for a project and its users. Uh, visual processing. So tall trees, um, grasses, water, 
um, and even people are the semantic elements of a landscape. Um, and our capacity to process, um, to make associations, and to sustain interest in these elements increases with greater information density or information richness. So our capacity to do this visual processing, as they call it, um, explains why most of us find the four pictures in this image um, increase in interest from left to right. So the gray box is not that interesting, but as you move across the screen, each image provides a greater diversity of information points. And so as far to the far right, this, this image is most likely for most of us on this call today, the most interesting. So in the built environment, complex dynamic architectural elements will be perceived as more interesting than those with less complex geometries. This is referred to as visual processing. So fractals and self are self-repeating patterns that allow for this ease, ease of visual processing. Um, naturally occurring fractals like snowflakes, ferns, um, crackling fire and ocean waves, they're very easy for us to process. Um, over time, we as humans have adapted to easily, efficiently, and fluidly process these naturally occurring fractal patterns. And this, this phenomenon is referred to as fractal fluency. In the built environment, fractal patterns are most commonly applied to architectural components like window mullions, frit, railings, screens, partitions, um, but they can also be found in fenestration hierarchies, um, building profiles, and city skylines, as well as um, fabric and upholstery or textile patterns. So there's a number of ways that this can, build, um, can be applied to the built environment. Attention restoration theory posits that when experiencing nature, the prefrontal cortex of the brain quiets down, allowing us to use less energy when processing what is being experienced. And so I'm using the word processing a lot. This, visual, this concept of visual processing is a bit of a theme throughout these different topics, right? Um, so our ability to process, you know, can take energy. And so the more we have to process, the more energy it takes. So we can get really fatigued by it. So the easier it is to process, the more energy we have to expend on other activities or work or you know tasks. So um, ease of visual processing um, influences our cognitive behavior, our personality expression and decision-making, and it also moderates our social behavior. But what's fascinating about attention restoration theory is that it only takes about 40 seconds of viewing nature for this shift to occur, for this relief to occur, when the brain um, ha has, a significant, has significantly impacted by this experience. Um, it can impact how you function throughout the day. You know that just that single moment can have a recurring, um, compounding impact. And then uh, psychoacoustics. So acoustics on its, own, on its own is the science of sound, whereas psychoacoustics is the science of sound perception or what the brain subconsciously chooses to hear and the meaning we attach to that sound. Through evolution, the positive perception we attribute to nature sounds like a babbling brook or bird song enables more effective relaxation and mask of distracting noise than the typical mechanical masking methods like white noise. And finally, alesthesia. Um, it's also known as thermal delight. Alesthesia was first introduced in 1992 by French physiologist um, Michel Cabanac. Uh, and alesthesia can be both temporal or spatial. Um, usually uh, experienced as a thermal stimuli, but it can also be visual or auditory or other sensory related experience. Um, in workplace design, uh, in particular, alesthesia manifests as a conditioning of people um, rather than 
space, like rather than the entire space. So conditioning, particularly of their hands and feet or, or your ankles and wrists, um, rather than the whole space. And familiar design mechanisms are operable windows, um, desktop fans, um, tabletops made of materials with differing thermal conditions or thermal properties, such as wood and metal, instead of wood or metal. Um, so these themes that appear in science can also be kind of organized as 15 patterns or 15 experiences of biophilic design, 15 experiences of nature that each have enough science that we are, we, we have created this pattern language. So the different patterns support different outcomes. And it's uh, particularly helpful when you're trying to understand which pattern to implement. Um, first by understanding what are you trying to achieve? Which health outcomes or experiences are you trying to achieve? And then being able to select that pattern and apply it accordingly. Um, one of the main reasons that we created the 15 patterns was to help establish this language that designers can use to have these conversations around um, health and well-being in the built environment. So the 15 patterns, um, after looking at hundreds of research papers, um, they boiled down to these 15, these 15 patterns. And another way to look at these 15 patterns is to organize them into three categories. There's nature in the space, which really involves the plants, water, animals, um, the, just the, the physical, uh, physical elements within the space that can be, they can be temporal or they can be tactile. Um, and then natural analogs, which are more like objects, materials, um, shapes, forms, uh, representations of natural um, elements. And then nature of the space, which really looks more at the spatial conditions, the volumes um, of, the, of the built environment. So just to give you a better sense of what each of these might look like, visual connection with nature, being able to make that, that, um, that direct connection, either physically or just visually. Uh, Non-visual connection really addresses some of those, the, the other, um, the other sense, senses, not so much of, of design and architecture is focused on the visual, the visual experience. So non-visual connection is really um, about um, smell and tactile experience. And then there's non-resonant sensory stimuli, which has to do more with um, momentary um, stochastic or, or non-rhythmic, obviously. Um, I don't want to call them distractions, but uh, kind of the bird flying by the window is a non-rhythmic -sen non sensory stimuli, something you don't expect. Presence of water, um, thermal airflow uh, and airflow variability, dynamic and diffuse light, and then connection with natural systems, really understanding the sky, you know, what's, what are the weather patterns? What are the changes in the landscape? Um, knowing when it's raining and when it's not. Um, there's a connection to place that it really enforces. So when we think about each of these patterns, um, we, I think it's important to remember that, well, each of them are backed by science, but when applying it to a design problem, it's important to make the connection between that pattern in nature, the experience it offers, and the parameters that will inform the design solution. So I'm not going to go through every pattern today. We don't have enough time. But to give you a sense of what that might look like for dynamic and diffuse light, if you think about the dappled light on the forest floor or the, the changes in light color over the course of the day, in the design realm, you might think of circadian effective lighting, um, your window to wall ratio, um, the lighting from multiple sources, um, your the partitions within the space, what might block um, or allow in 
those different lighting conditions. So natural analogs, biomorphic forms and patterns, material connection with nature, complexity and order. And then nature of the space, prospect, refuge, mystery, risk, peril, and awe. So each of these patterns really have um, unique um, health benefits, um, but these benefits basically can be lumped together as a health, like an overall health and well being strategy for your building, for a room, for a community, for a city. And they allow for all these um, different benefits that might be more appropriate for certain spaces than others. But ultimately, you can find, um, you can find a, a good reason to incorporate or a good opportunity to incorporate biophilic design into um, any type of space. And some of these here, the first one may be familiar to you all. Um, so to talk about each of these patterns, I thought it might be best to show some case studies. And they're in no particular order. So if you have questions after the presentation about any one of these, I'd be happy to jump back and, and take a closer look. So um, this, the Riga Spa, um, many of you may have be familiar with the Capella Sentosa um, Hotel and Resort. Um, I stayed here a couple years ago and it, it, one thing I should say, being from somewhere other than Singapore, um, in the, in the U S, uh, particularly in the Northeast, um, and then just the North in general, um, a lot of the examples that people show in biofilm design are of tropical places because it's so easy to incorporate, I mean, relatively speaking, it's easy to incorporate vegetation for year round enjoyment. Well, in the Northeast, um, uh, in the US, that's not always the case. The temperature just does not allow it. So one of the things I really like to um, emphasize in biophilic design are the great examples that don't use um, plants. And that's not to say that plants aren't um, a valuable contribution, but there are many ways to incorporate biophilic design. So this, despite being in Singapore, is a fantastic example of um, representational nature and mystery conditions. Um, there, there's plenty of, of vegetation on this site, but this particular experience was quite unique in what it had to offer, walking along this pathway and having the trickling sounds of the water and the light shimmering up on the uh, sculptural condition there on the wall of a school of fish going by very biophilic experience. Um, and this example is unique because it is in hospitality and this is actually um, a hotel and spa in South Carolina in the US. And what is special about this, it is an example of diffuse and dynamic light. But what makes this project particularly special is that it has not needed a renovation um, in 25 years. And it's extremely unusual for a uh, hotel to not, to not really have a regular refresh. So it kind of brings to bear this idea of really good biofill design or just good design in general um, can stand the test of time. So uh, considering when you're in the design process, considering what aspects um, of biophilic design can help retain the timelessness of your final project. Uh, jumping to residential, um, this, this is a, a townhome in uh, New Jersey, uh, just uh, outside of New York City. And what's special about this from a biophilic standpoint was that the owners, um, the whole building was restored, but the owners focused on the little, the details. 
they they put their money towards um, the the smaller experiential components rather than trying to um, distribute the budget over the entire property. Uh, so they focused on small elements like the the tactile components, the um, hardware in particular, uh, but also uh, like in the washrooms, they went uh, made them highly information rich. You can see with the the bottom photo with the um, wallpaper, and so it's details like that that really made the experience of the house very special. Um, and then so so another example here would be that they put the money into restoring the medallion on the ceiling in the lower left, sorry, the lower right hand image, but um, used a lower budget for the actual lighting fixture, knowing that over time they might want to change the lighting fixture, but the medallion would stay. So um, is uh, deciding where to, to put the money and for what reason. So um, it really adds a timelessness to this space. Another residential example um, is this multi-family um, housing complex in New York City. And this is a communal terrace. And on the left-hand side, the little inset image shows the, pr the prior condition. And the right-hand larger image is after renovation. So it's the same space. The architecture of the space was not changed, just the placement of the plantings and the seating. So they actively and deliberately created refuge spaces, but allowed for, um, for the, the seating, seating areas to be able to see through the space. So there's that creation of these cozy seating nooks, uh, but allows the, for social gathering. Whereas the picture on the left, the original condition is not as inviting. Right, the, there, it's really individual like lawn chairs um, and the, the connection to community is not as strong. From an education standpoint, um, this example show is, is, it's a school in Maryland um, outside of Washington DC. And the left hand, lower left hand picture is the existing condition of the classrooms and the lower right hand condition is the biophilic classroom. So this was actually a research project to incorporate biophilic design patterns through textiles and um, window blinds to see how the students would respond um, both uh, from be behavioral changes to um, their heart rate as well as their testing scores. And um, these very simple interventions uh, had immense impact. The students did uh, performed a lot better. They were much calmer in class. And even the teachers found themselves taking their breaks in this classroom because it was more restorative than your typical classroom. And you can see the um, the difference between a control classroom and the biophilic classroom in the, the patterns on the window blinds, they're made to look like tree shadows. And in fact, those are not, they're not real trees outside. I mean, there are real trees outside, but those shadows are actually screen printed onto the blinds. So it gives that dappled light ex experience, um, much unlike the control classroom. So moving into retail, um, this example is, is un unique um, for a, a couple of reasons. One is that I mean, it's, a, it's a, a retail space, a small retail space, um, but it's on a busy urban street in Milan. And the design team intentionally wanted to create a space that was a refuge from the busy urban condition. And this idea of a forest came to bear, but when they created the forest and they put the, the glass on the ceilings, it was meant to just seem like this infinite space. 
and they had a very unexpected um, uh, benefit from this approach is this the raw wood actually had a scent to it. So when you're in the space, it actually smells like a forest. And that was an accidental um, outcome from the project. So not only does it create this um, refuge and mystery condition, as you, you know, you can't see where the forest ends, um, but you also actually smell like you're in the forest. Uh, this example is from a coffee shop in China and uh, in Beijing, and it's in a high rise. So they wanted to set this, um, the coffee shop apart from the rest of the retail in the, on the floor uh, and make it, you know, its unique own space. And this was really a collaboration between the interior designers and landscape. Um, and uh, it was not intended to have this misty condition, but the mist was a way to keep the vegetation uh, moist. And the outcome was the misty condition. So you have this mystery going on, but the connection to nature, amazing views of the city. And so what's important to think here is that it's not just about one element. And this is a recurring theme is that biophilia is often a combination of two or three patterns done really well. And this is, this is a prime example of that. You know, having, having a coffee shop with plants in it, it's really nice. Having a coffee shop with views is nice. But when you add all these pieces together, you get a, a biophilic experience rather than just a biophilic item or intervention. So in healthcare, um, there's a lot of great healthcare examples out there. Um, and uh, several of them are in Singapore. Um, and Kutek Pwok, I, I know you guys are familiar with that one. Um, this, this example is from um, Leeds in the UK. And it's actually a, quite a small building. It's a, it's a cancer center uh, for uh, people who are, who are going through cancer treatment. Um, it's not an actual treatment center. It's more of a, a community center. Um, but this was intentionally designed with biophilia in mind and create, they use this idea of um, the arches as a way to wrap your arms around people kind of as a, to be welcoming um, and comfortable space, more like home than a hospital. So the interior is quite fantastic. They have plants on the inside and the outside. They have great lighting conditions um, and we all look to the interior of this space, but what's unique about this space also, or this building in particular, is if you see the inset on the left, this plot of land was just kind of a barren grassy area on a very um, built up medical campus. So there wasn't anything unique or biophilic about the campus at all. And the presence of this building now makes the experience of the camp, it transforms the experience of the campus. So it's, it's an interesting look at how the building cannot just transform the experience inside for the users, but outside for everybody. Um, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's a really special example. And it is, um, it is the, uh, one of the 20, 20 um, biophilic uh, Stephen Keller biophilic design award winners. Maggie's lead. All right, so another community scale example is this library from Calgary in Canada. Um, Snowhead, I was the architect. And what's unique about this space is not just the volume, it's a very large building. Um, and it, it was really designed to be a community center. Um, you know, libraries are going through a transformation these days um, with like, you know, addressing or rethinking how they serve the community. 
um, especially in this digital age. So bringing, I mean, it's a very urban area as well. So the use of wood um, was really intended to create that material connection. Um, Calgary in that area of, of um, Canada is very forested. And so wood was a natural um, choice for, for the space. Um, but prospect and refuge are also um, quite important in this space too. It, because it's so big, those sm smaller refuge spaces are very nece necessary. But being able to see where to go, um, it's weight, prospect is a great way, wayfinding tool. It's important for decision-making um, and has, um, has a, uh, a good way of communicating whether something is safe, uh, someplace is safe to go. Um, and uh, so it, it, it prospect is a, is a great pattern for every, you know, almost every type of project. Um, so thinking on the, uh, in the renovation and re repurposing um, era, uh, end of things, this building is an old corn silo. Um, it's in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. And they converted the, um, Heatherwick Studio converted this silo or a series of silos into a museum. Uh, the muse the Zeitz Mocha is the museum of um, contemporary African art. And they decided to cut out the center of the silo. So in fact, each of these circles is one of the silos. The circles in the ceiling, those are the silos that were cut out. And so this form, this biomorphic form was a almost an accident. Like they, they didn't really know what they were going to find inside. So they, they carved out this central core to discover these amazing biomorphic patterns. Um, the image on the right is the, the, the higher levels of the building that were added on um, to the construction where the art is actually held. And so the kind of bubble-like windows have a fractal quality to them. When you're inside the lighting, the, there's a more of a dynamic use of lighting um, th throughout the space rather than uniform lighting that you would typically find in a museum. Um, another community scale project is actually this office building. Um, and it's in, along the High Line in New York City. And for those of you who are not familiar with the High Line, it is an old, it's the image on the lower right where you see the person walking. It is a, an old elevated railway that was converted into a, a park, a vertical, like a linear park that goes through the city. And since this, the High Line, um, the High Line is the poster child for neighborhood revitalization and economic resurgence. Um, and it's really transformed that area of New York City um, with billions of dollars of investment. Most of the, most of the buildings along the High Line are housing, um, multifamily high rises and such. This building here uh, by Cook Fox Architects is uh, one of the first and only uh, office buildings that was built along the High Line. And um, it was designed with multiple terraces, uh, minimal right angles, um, outdoor work and meeting areas, and an outdoor staircase specifically for feeling like an extension of the High Line. So this building, the, the form and the design of the building is absolutely a response to the High Line and the physical proximity to this green space. So they didn't need to design in a whole bunch of green space on the property. They were able to, the soft edges create this, like no matter how, you know, what window you look out of, you're looking right, you're looking onto the, the, the high line. Uh, the outdoor staircases, you can sit and have meetings there or eat your lunch there and feel like you're in a park. So this, the, the architecture and the form of the building are a direct response to its proximity to nature. Uh, the Admiralty is a great example of um, 
that visual connection with nature, obviously, but also this complexity and order um, for wayfinding and navigation um, and uh, prospect as well. There's, it's, a, it's a quite a spectacular um, example. People who are inside can see out to nature. People who are outside can weave around and experience nature, not just next to them, but above them and below them. So it's a really um, unique, unique example. Um, one more, or a couple more community examples. Um, I think one of the often underlooked opportunities or overlooked opportunities are the interstitial spaces in the urban fabric. Um, those places uh, that are in between um, or the alleyways or just the connectors between different buildings. Um, these two examples are quite different examples, actually, despite the fact they look very similar. On the left, you have, uh, they're both Calatrava examples, um, but the one on the left is in between a series of buildings in Toronto that actually links them together to create this almost like a arcade uh, that in, in the cold winters of Toronto really helps protect the, the pedestrian, but also and creates this really awe-inspiring experience to walk through. The one on the, on the right is the Oculus in New York City, um, which is quite recent. And um, the experience of walking through this space is like walking through a cathedral. But there's also, there's other things going on here. The dynamic light coming through in between those, um, the, in between and above the building um, can be quite stunning at times. And the Oculus actually opens that, that, that window at the top does, um, does open at times. So you have this very unique experience. Um, so, the, I mean, this, these are quite, dramatic examples. Um, and the Oculus was a very expensive example. But um, what's important to point out here is that your the volume and the, the use of light and volume can have a profound impact on the experience of space. Now at a completely different scale, uh, we have the um, VAC library in, um, in Hanoi in Vietnam. And what's special about this place and the next couple examples actually are not just that it's good biofilled design, but that they have multiple functions beyond just serving, um, serving a, a space or a, a individual function. And this one is called a library, but in fact, it's really an interactive learning environment. Um, the multi-sensory connection with nature is not just because there's nature around you and you can hear it, but the programming supports learning about um, uh, animal husbandry and fishing and other things that wouldn't normally be associated with urban living. So it's connecting children to nature in a way that they've never experienced before and they would normally not get to experience in an urban setting. Um, Paley Park is a classic example of urban biophilic design. Um, this, is, this was built in 1967 and has not changed. It remains just as it was. And um, what's really unique about this place is that it's so simple. Um, you know, you've really just, you've got trees, you have a waterfall in the background, you have some seating and there's some ivy on the wall. But it's on a really busy, it's again, a really busy part of New York City. And the streets are loud and there's a lot of traffic. But when you step up into this space, your perception of the environment completely transforms. And it can be experienced, the experience is different at different times of day. You see the dappled lighting here and now, and then on the picture on the left, you see it at night.
but these tr the the tree species is also important to think about when you're when you're trying to create spaces like this because this species the lo the honey locust allows for the dappled light if you get a denser canopy you won't get the damp the the lighting condition um, and then what happens at different seasons you know when the leaves fall off or they change color like that experience changes so another um, key issue I like to point out with this project is that it is so simple and so powerful in that the design choices have a huge impact on how you experience the space. So this, this space in particular, I've experienced at different times of year and under different conditions and conditions including renovation of adjacent property. So there's scaffolding everywhere and the place is still like it's unattractive in that sense like you're just you're around construction but the place was filled with people eating lunch because the experience of the waterfall and the lighting was so strong but you can go in there other times of the year when there's no construction and it looks beautiful but the water's turned off when the water's turned off suddenly there's no masking of that urban street sound and the, the vibe is completely different. So it br brings that question about, again, it's like, what patterns make this space work? And if I take that pattern out, does it completely change the experience? And so it's a great way to critique your own work and say, am I doing a good job at this? If I take this element out, does my space still work? And if it still works, does that mean I don't really need that element? Or is that element critical to making a truly biophilic experience? So uh, a couple more examples uh, to round us out here. This is um, an urban park in Oregon in the US. Um, it's another great example of a multifaceted or multi-purpose space. It's really a park designed to manage the neighborhood's rainwater. So, you know, the water recedes and increases at different times of year. There's an educational component or programming to it. Um, there's opportunities to interact with the water, uh, but there's also different conditions within the park to, you know, be really connected to the to the water or to sit up in spaces that are more protected by trees, creating that refuge condition. Um, so there's a number of experiences within this small landscape that um, are biophilic in themselves. The whole, the whole package you get, you, you have a multifunctional um, biophilic design intervention. Um, and then I'd like to close with a couple examples of workplace. Um, and this, this workplace example actually bridges a couple, um, a couple topics of relevance to us today in that it is a, an office building. Um, it, it was originally a rather unattractive office building from the 1960s or 70s. And uh, the new tenant decided to do a gut renovation of the space. Um, but a few things were going on here. Um, they didn't own the building, but they knew that they wanted to occupy it long term. They also knew that the building was too small for their needs. So how do they uh, interface is, is the uh, tenant. So inter how does interface create a space or make use of an existing property without expanding the footprint while also connecting to nature and making it a place that people love to be. So prof, prospect and refuge were priority conditions um, that they called out from the very beginning. They wanna have, they want their, their employees to be able to um, see each other and work with each other and un know what's going on at any given time, but also feel comfortable retreating to a space to get their work done. Um, and so they, they created a very open, nimble space that allows uh, employees to move, 
to different spatial conditions based on whatever activity they're working on at a given time. So, um, so, so there's, that was one aspect of biofloat design. That was the interior design solution. The exterior design solution was to wrap the building in a 3M film that was a, uh, a relief of the forest across the street. And it seems like a very literal, like a representation of nature, but in fact, it had multiple, um, multiple benefits. One was that it created a standout brand image for them. Uh, two, it had that biophilic connection to creating these fractal patterns on the windows, but also preventing some of the glare um, and heat gain that would normally happen if they you know, didn't have um, any other uh, intervention. But ultimately it was a lot um, less expensive than doing frit. So they had this multifaceted approach, the interior design that met um, and the exterior uh, facade treatment that married together to create this more holistic biophilic experience. So in my last example here, um, I want to talk about Cook Fox Architects um, office building. And well, it's not their office building, sorry, it's their, their studio. And so um, on the left hand side, you have the condition before they moved in. This was previously occupied by an engineering firm and um, they transformed it. Um, this is 2006 and they were already intentionally using biophilic design concepts um, and views to nature was very important. Daylighting was very important and they actively sought out to, to create those conditions. So you see the after condition, it's the same exact space but they opened it up and they created this fantastic prospect refuge, or sorry, prospect condition, views to nature, daylighting. And so this is what the space looked like when they occupied it. Um, very open, that open, um, open plan condition. There were a few conference rooms, but wonderful uh, green roof. You know, the space got a lot of attention. It was on the cover of um, National Geographic. Everyone really loved working there. Um, and it was kind of a jump off point for them, for a soundboard, for them talking about biophilia with their clients. Um, so natural materials was a big factor in the design, um, air quality, visual connection, like I said, um, and then the connection with natural systems. Over the time being there, that green roof evolved um, and started having living, you know, little colonies of bees and butterflies and birds. And so it was really a space that everyone could enjoy from a distance. The reality here, um, the, if you see on the lower right hand corner, the roof only has a simple metal railing around it. So technically um, for insurance purposes, we, nobody was allowed to occupy the roof. You could only be out there for maintenance purposes. So it was actually a, a, um, a, an, a an issue with a lot of people who worked there because they wanted to be able to actively and routinely enjoy the roof, but they weren't allowed out there. So um, after 10 years of occupying this space, they conducted a uh, post-occupancy evaluation. And uh, they measured, or they, they broke the office up into zones based on like your workplace pod. Uh, kind of looked like this. Each of the zones are numbered here. So when they did their survey, you know, you, you stated which zone you, you occupied. And the survey revealed a couple of really interesting details about the biophilic experience. One um, was that the people, people loved it. Great daylighting, um, great views. Prospect was excellent throughout the space. But the biggest issue that arose was 
that certain, certain groups felt stressed and certain groups felt like um, there weren't enough refuge conditions. Those were the two biggest criticisms of the space. And as it turned out, as we mapped it out, this is a map, a stress map of the office. Um, the, the light blue were the, the people who reported the least amount of occupational stress. The darker blue represent moderate to low stress. Um, and one thing that's worth pointing out is zone one. The reason you think that because you're so close to nature, the green roof and the views to the sky that zone one should have as little stress as, as um, possible. But in fact, this is the entry point to the office. This is where all visitors come. People stand by the window and look out the window. They're having conversations. So there's a bit of interruption. But uh, the light orange color, there was more stress reported. And then the dark orange was the most stress. And you know, there's a lot of factors here that influence your experience of the workplace. So you could say that um, the people who are experiencing the most stress in the office was because they happen to be near the kitchen and near the printer room and near the exit. And those may all be true, but so are the other zones, eight, 11, and 12. So why is zone nine so intensely um, stressed? And the one factor that's different from the entire rest of the office space is that is the only place in the office that it does not have a view to outdoors. So we can't so say for sure that, that it is in fact the fact that the lack of views that in, induce the stress, but it is an interesting um, concern that was taken seriously when it came time to look for a new office. So um, when uh, a couple years ago, they started shopping around, they gave their real estate agent a few biophilic design parameters to help them prioritize space selection. Um, and you know, people can often say, oh, we want daylight or we want a backyard or something. You know, that's not atypical for, for when you're looking for an apartment, right? But for an office building, this was a little unusual. They said they had to have occupiable outdoor space. They had, everybody had to have views to outdoors, but they also wanted spaces for refuge condition um, and, they wanted to be able to have lots of communal spaces. So this office is the outcome of that effort. Um, by, uh, two, 250 West 57th Street is in Midtown, New York, and it seats about 100 people. And uh, so the, each of these spaces shown in the pictures are a response to, they're a biophilic response to the, that post-occupancy survey and an understanding of what the users really um, found most important. So you have great refuge conditions, you have lots of planting of outdoor occupiable seats that are cooler. Um, so to wrap this up, um, I have, I think what's important to point out is to understand what works, like these two examples here, um, this is an office space on the left built by um, or designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, it's the Johnson Wax Administrative Building Administration Building um, in Wisconsin. And it's remained largely unchanged since it was built in 1960. On the right hand side is a Citizen M Hotel. This one's in New York, but they have um, off, they have hotels around the world and they have a dynamic multi-use lobbies um, that really, this one in particular in New York um, has this indoor outdoor, the blurring of that boundary between indoors and outdoors that I think is really unique. And a lot of people try to replicate this experience, um, some with, with more success than others. But knowing what works for a space and what doesn't, these are both biophilic design interventions that did not work. The one on the left was an attempt at creating an, um, a, a conference room that had 
um, some frosted glass, but also cutouts that allowed some direct light to come in. But because of the nature of the user group, which was, they were working with highly sensitive information, they went over and put stick it no sticky notes, post-it notes on all the cutouts. So now you have these weird post-it notes that just stay there. Um, so that was uh, a result of not knowing or not understanding the user group and what intervention would work best for them. On the right-hand side, you have a before and after condition. Um, this is a Glumac engineering office in Shanghai. And they, the whole office itself is quite fantastic. Um, renovation of a historic building. Um, it's quite biophilic as well. But one of their interventions was this um, biodiverse green wall that's right in the center of the space. And um, they were very excited about this uh, design and it was quite lovely as you can see. But it occurred to them after the fact that the coordination between the engineering, the lighting design and the landscaping um, had not been, well, it hadn't been coordinated enough. So basically the interior lighting ended up burning uh, the plants and the plants were dying. So they had to remove that wall and replace it with um, the planting on the right hand side. And the ones on the right um, are perfectly fine, but they're, they've lost the biodiversity. And when it comes to landscape, from a biophilic perspective, um, and also just a healthy landscape perspective, a more biodiverse um, planting selection is going to have a more positive um, health outcome for the users as well as the plants. So lessons learned there. So just to um, kind of recap here, some of the rules of thumb for biophilic design are that uh, you really wanna aim for a multi-sensory experience. It's not just about the visual condition. Um, one of the best ways to get buy-in from um, a client or your collaborators, your teammates, is to give them that personal experience to like, win over their, their heart. Um, so once, you know, if, if you are trying to create a certain condition, one of the best ways to, to, to get the rest of the team to want to want to do it as well is to bring them to an example of that, um, of what, why it works so well. Um, I know today in the time of COVID, that's not always easy, but, um, videos can help. They're not ideal, but you know, they're, they're better than a static, static photo. So do what you can to establish that emotional connected connection with the experience. And then um, a th the third rule of thumb would be to, to focus on just a few patterns and not try to do them all. Um, better to, to do a few really well than to distribute it and um, have more of a flatter experience. Um, another way to integrate biophilic design into your design process is to think about um, fundamental strategies up front that really needed to be sides, but be decided in that for the first, the early phases of the design, um, the nature of the space patterns like prospect refuge, um, that awe experience, anything that has to do with big volumes, of course, we're going to are going to be in the beginning. Um, but getting leadership commitment or, you know, as a t if you're working with a team, like deciding up front what your priorities are, um, and you may have certain design priorities and how does biophilia fit into that? And then um, conducting things like a gap analysis, doing, um, having workshops on these specific issues, um, how they inter how they maybe overlap with energy issues or um, social priorities. Um, what are the other issues you're trying to tackle and how does biophilia fit into that? How can it support it? Um, and then conducting some sort of peer review to make sure that the design changes that you're making, um, the adaptations or innovations, that they're actually upholding your intended um, commitment. 